This is a production of Cornell University. Um, last time, uh, I said that there were sort of five bedrock principles of marketing we're going to come back to uh, uh, periodically over the course of the semester. We talked about the first uh, couple of them. Uh, we ended up by saying uh, one of the uh, goals uh, that's uh, uh, that, well, uh, the uh, bedrock principles that we'll return to is this notion in marketing that it's important to satisfy customers. And in fact, that's a strategic goal, along with some of these uh, other strategic goals that you'll see in most uh, business organizations. And um, we ended the class by saying, how does one bring about customer satisfaction? What are the elements of customer satisfaction? And we recognize that uh, it's not just about communicating the wonders and the benefits, the attributes of your products and services to the external world. But in order to do that, maybe first we need to look internally at not only the production process, but also uh, how employees are motivated and are organized to produce the desired result. And so we talked about encouraging uh, employee involvement. Uh, I want to talk a little bit more about that this morning and uh, uh, the importance of of uh, empowering employees to make uh, decisions on their own because it can be fairly dangerous if you don't do that. Take a look. You've got to be mindful to empower employees to make decisions or results can be catastrophic. So let's examine this customer satisfaction and how to get there a little uh, more carefully. Um, the notion of why to satisfy customers has an economic and, fa and financial rationale, of course. And the notion is simply this, that we, we believe or we, we, we think it's, it's logical that customer satisfaction will lead to loyalty from customers to your business, to your product lines. Uh, lo loyalty to products should lead to sales. And maybe that also leads to profits. So that's a fairly logical sequence of things to assume. Uh, we'll examine that a little more carefully in just a minute. And in, in fact, um, that satisfied customers are really precious to a business. Uh, you've heard uh, a lot of uh, uh, information, anecdotal and otherwise, over the years probably, that a, a really valuable customer is worth his or her weight in gold, whereas a, a customer that's irritated or somehow dissatisfied, unhappy, can tell uh, dozens and dozens of friends about just how uh, bad your business is. And um, uh, you can think about the relationship between satisfaction and loyalty sort of in the following way. If you draw uh, a couple axes here, uh, whoa, you see that uh, on the vertical axis, I've got loyalty. Percentage of customers who may be loyal uh, to your product or business. And on the horizontal axis is the satisfaction scale. Uh, let's just imagine uh, 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 one to five, very satisfied, uh, uh, very uh, dissatisfied is one, and very satisfied is five. The issue here is, of course, the more satisfied the customers, the more loyal they're likely to be to your business. But an awful lot of research indicates that that is not a monotonically, perfectly increasing function. And more specifically, it's sort of nonlinear and looks sort of like this. So that if I'm a, a customer who's uh, number two on the satisfaction scale, not really that satisfied, uh, I'm not going to be very loyal. So if I'm only two on the satisfaction scale, uh, you see where I am on the loyalty scale. And the same with number three. If I'm number three, well, I'm a little more satisfied, and I'm a little bit more loyal. But still, it's kind of disappointing from a firm uh, uh, perspective to see that the first uh, two, three, or four satisfaction categories really produce quite a low level of loyalty. All of a sudden, the difference between fours and fives is apparent. So if you're a number four, on the satisfaction scale, uh, and, and I drew that line uh, somewhat casually, I'm not positive that's the exact uh, precise numerical loyalty score, but you're only about a 25% loyalty uh, uh, score to this particular firm or product. Whereas if you go to a five, if you're really very satisfied, all of a sudden you're an obsessive fan uh, of this particular company, and you see that 
the, the consumers up here in this area are uh, often by firms or by marketing literature called apostles. They are so passionate about your business that they're out telling other people, you really need to buy this product. You really need to patronize uh, this particular company or service because they are so awesome. Listen to the things they do. And so you're, you're, really, uh, you're really trying to produce customers who are so satisfied that, that, that they're that loyal. Uh, as opposed to the cons customers down here are often called terrorists because they're so irritated. They're so angry at the, uh, uh, the imbeciles in your company that aren't serving them well that they're actually out there trying to create uh, unfavorable impressions for your business. So uh, very satisfied are apostles, very dissatisfied are the so-called terrorists. Um, and finally, that leads us to the last factor that I said uh, we're going to spend some time on this semester. And indeed, uh, these four Ps uh, we're going to study in uh, considerably more depth. We're going to spend a couple of weeks uh, on each of them. And some of the marketing mix factors are controllable, uh, and some are not. We're going to take a look at those uh, that are not uh, next time. But those that are controllable, the so-called four Ps, product, uh, price, uh, promotion, and place, um, you can think of as those are the tool, those are the uh, arrows in the quiver, those are the tools in the kit of the marketing manager, and the marketing manager can manipulate can control the extent to which price changes, marketing channels change, uh, communication or, or, or promotion uh, changes the consumer. So you take a category like uh, rollerblades, inline skates. Uh, a couple of uh, decades ago, a brand new category. Now one that has grown uh, incredibly. It's a, it's a new sport. And there are incredible amount of segments to this sport. There's the urban segment. There's the racing segment. There's the professional segment. There's the international segment. There's the recreational segment. And if you just think, uh, 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 this is uh, Rollerblade's uh, homepage that you see here. Uh, and if you just take a look at some of those segments as an example, and you apply those four Ps just to a couple of them. So up here in the, couple, the top column, you've got the, the uh, kids segment and the fitness segment. So uh, two of the, uh, among the many segments we could identify. And down the, the uh, right-hand column, you've got the marketing mix controllable factors, product place, uh, promotion, uh, product price, promotion, place. So in the kids segment uh, for the product, well, obviously, it's a different product for, for kids. They offer the junior. Uh, this is the rollerblade uh, product. Uh, a skate for uh, children that extends. I guess it expands. I'm not an expert in the juniors. Uh, so that it changes four shoe sizes. One of the issues, of course, for children and for parents, their feet grow rapidly. You can't buy a new uh, rollerblade uh, size uh, every six months. So it has an expandable uh, feature, apparently. The fitness segment has a different kind of product. Uh, they offer the core and the fusion skates for beginning and intermediate skaters who want fun and exercise. Uh, the price is uh, a lot less for the kids segment, as you see, than it would be for the fitness segment. The way you communicate with kids, uh, ha of course, is different. Demo vans to introduce children in inline skating. Uh, ads in newspapers in the fitness segment might be uh, in magazines that are uh, patronized by or read by uh, the target segment and so on. So a pretty simple example, and we're going to have lots of, of, of uh, uh, better and more in-depth examples as we move through the semester. But you use those four Ps to describe a different marketing strategy uh, to, uh, uh, aimed at different targets in your marketing plan. OK. Um, let me make the following point. I told you we're going to have some viewpoints, some opportunities for you to uh, 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 express yourself and articulate a view on marketing. The last couple of classes, I've been presenting this marketing orientation, this marketing concept, as if it were the holy grail. Anybody who lives so deeply in a cave and are so benighted that they don't understand consumer satisfaction and the goal of a firm should be to satisfy the consumer first and put the consumer first uh, must be uh, uh, living in the dark ages, as we point out here. So that sounds like the, the, uh, the, uh, the direction this course is going to emphasize importantly, and indeed it is. But what's wrong with this claim? In other words, I'm putting this out there as if it's the only thing uh, to which managers uh, should subscribe. Uh, what's wrong with it? So get out a piece of paper. This is a practice. Not going to collect these. 
Get out a piece of paper and think to yourself, I don't mind if you talk to your neighbors about this, spend two or three minutes and put down a couple bullet items that you'd like to punch a hole in this argument. So what's wrong with the marketing concept? Hey, Rachel, go, go, up, go up and get a handheld mic from Matt, would you? A handheld microphone. Right. Great, great question. That's what we're going to spend the semester figuring out how to do. How do you take unhappy customers and really make them into, yeah. So you do things, first, first of all, you have to figure out why they're unhappy. That leads to market research, and that's what we're going to start studying next. You've got to figure out what it is that motivates them. Why are, why are they unhappy? And then you address it. <clears throat> One more minute. The hum quieted down. That means everybody's all set. I'm waiting for a handheld mic here. Okay, who's, who can tell me what's wrong or one of the things they believe might be wrong with this concept? Rachel, you're awesome. Thank you. Hello? Hello? Oh, okay. What's wrong with the marketing concept? Over here first. I'm going to call on somebody, unless I see a cheerful face with a willing hand. <laughs> There's a willing hand over there. Okay, pass that down here. And, and tell me uh, what you think's wrong with it. Um, well, first of all, what the individual wants, the individual customer wants, might not be what the majority of the customers want. And I also think that the customer can be illogical sometimes can be illogical. Yes. Okay. So customers can be illogical and individuals might not follow the general trend. Okay. That could be, of course, an opportunity at the same time. What, what do you think? Um, I don't know. I think that people are concerned about the quality of the product. So if you market it as something that's better than it is, d am I not answering the question? <laughs> I'm not sure. So, so you can market. You're answering some you questions. Can market a product all you want, but if the product is not what you've just marketed, then the customer will be dissatisfied. For example, if the product is poor quality, the customer's not expecting Okay, that. so you don't want to you don't want to uh, try to advertise something that's not uh, true. Right. Uh, otherwise, it's the f it's the quickest way to uh, lead your product to failure if you're promising something that you're not delivering. Right. Okay, so first of all, you got to be honest about the product. Okay, uh, one more one more. Uh, insight up here um, sometimes the customer just is not logical about what the um, their wants are and it wouldn't be feasible for the company to provide their wants it might not be cost okay. effective okay so somebody said down below uh, cu customers aren't always logical they're not always reasonable and fair they might be asking something for that's outlandish company might be able to provide it but not at a profit or okay what, what, what else Um, basically, I think if you run a customer-based business, customer opinion and attitudes are always changing. So failure to continue to satisfy the customer can result in, you know, a crash in your business. Yeah, okay. So drawing uh, attention to the fact that, it, that uh, and we, we talked about this a little bit the, the other day, the customers are, are always changing. The, the market is a moving target, and if you satisfy customers in the short run, that doesn't necessarily guarantee long run. Satisfaction. Okay, uh, one more. 
some people are going to object to marketing in any form, so the more you push, the more that customer is going to run away. Okay, so if there's a form of marketing that uh, is uh, offensive advertising or seems to be in your face all the time and maybe doesn't really lead you to what your true uh, goals are, uh, consumers might be alienated and, and actually uh, uh, disaffected with the product. Okay, if, mark, if marketing is misleading or people feel they're being lied to, uh, they're going to they're gonna be uh, certainly unfavorably uh, inclined toward your product. Okay, so all good points. Um, uh, that's the kind of information uh, I, I want you to think about and articulate in a little more formal form once we uh, have some real viewpoints. But let's go through some reasons um, why, uh, although this marketing orientation is indeed one of the... Uh, principal planks in the platform of this course and of marketing, uh, there's a number of things uh, that you need to be aware of. So certain problems with the marketing concept. Um, the first is something that the marketing literature calls marketing myopia. Uh, myopia, you know, uh, narrow-sightedness, uh, uh, narrow vision. And uh, this was a term coined by a, a Harvard Business School professor, Ted Levitt, uh, a number of years ago. And uh, he studied a number of industries around the turn of the century, turn of the last century. And uh, one, for example, was the railroads. The railroad industry at the end uh, of the 1800s was obviously one of the real driving engines <laughs> of American economy. And uh, uh, all of the, the, the principal uh, railroad barons and, and were the, uh, were the, uh, the most affluent uh, 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 Americans at that point in time, but they saw their business fairly narrowly, fairly parochially, in terms of railroads. And what happened, of course, at the turn of the 20th century was uh, Henry Ford and his cohorts came up with another mode of transportation that became a little uh, uh, more uh, affordable and uh, a little more convenient. And so automobiles took over as the principal form of transportation because they viewed their, their, mode of their, their principal product line as railroad engines and railroad lines, railroad uh, travel only. And they didn't view it more broadly, for example, uh, like uh, airplanes and, and automobiles in the transportation area. So if you look at some companies today, and you uh, think about a sort of a myopic uh, description of their product, GE, for example. Well, sure, uh, it began as an appliance company. But GE views its vision and mission uh, uh, to serve customers much more broadly. Their, their slogan, as you know today, is imagination at work. Or AT&T, well, OK, sure, uh, started as a telephone company. Uh, today, it's your world delivered. In other words, these, and you can go through the rest of the list, the, these companies don't want to get caught in describing their business so myopically that they miss the broader opportunity for uh, satisfying customers. So one problem with the marketing concept is looking at your product line so narrowly that you think that's the only way uh, to move forward. Um, a second problem is something that also uh, departs directly from uh, microeconomics, and that is uh, marginal uh, revenues have to cover marginal costs. We're going to talk about some of that mar those marginal principles a little bit later in the semester. But clearly, it costs information to figure out what consumers want. So if this whole idea that, oh, we put the customer first, the customer is queen, the customer is king, uh, we satisfy customers always. Well, sure, but in order to do that, first you have to figure out what the customer wants what the needs and wants of the target market are. And in order to do that, you need to do some research. You need to hire some people. You need to spend some time. You need to do some analysis. And all that is costly. Um, and so uh, it's clear that that's important. But unless the additional revenue generated from the products that you produce as a result of that research cover the cost of having conducted the research, then of course uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, a third area is when researchers ask consumers, what is it that you want? We want to satisfy your wants and needs. We think marketing is about customer satisfaction, so what is it that's going to satisfy you? Uh, researchers only learn express needs. That is to say, they only learn the needs that consumers are good at articulating. 
And therein lies the conundrum. Consumers are notoriously poor at articulating certain kinds of things. Uh, they're uh, 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 often not very visionary. They can be, be misleading. They often are tech, uh, technologically naive. They don't understand uh, what it is technology can produce. Um, this is one of my favorite examples. Um, the Weather Channel. This is the Weather Channel. Um, the Weather Channel started uh, almost 20 years ago. It went on the air. And um, today, who could have predicted, who could have predicted that we needed a Weather Channel? I mean, who watches this thing? Uh, today, the huge effort of the Weather Channel makes to cover the repetitive story of weather. Uh, 1,840 employees, 15,000 affiliated cable stations, a news budget of several million dollars seems justified by its success. It has become part of the cable landscape with CNN and ESPN. When the channel started uh, in the 80s, people laughed. Even its own employees thought a national 24-hour-a-day, seven-day-a-week weather network? I mean, it seems like overkill, doesn't it? Um, wasn't the very point about weather that it was local and that we, no we watched it only when we needed to. But to everyone's surprise, the Weather Channel took off. The subscription base ballooned from 2 million to 125 million homes. It turned out that there were a lot of avid weather watchers out there. We've provided heroin for the addicts, the Weather Channel's chief meteorologist says. Today there are over 4,000 websites covering weather. People are watching programs longer than anyone expected. Eight minutes was the original projection, but now one in four people watch for 20 minutes or longer. <laughs> this, I love this, because you can see this in your own behavior. It says, this is a New York Times uh, Magazine article, by the way, is people come from their own weather, but then they get caught up, and they stay, and they watch their neighbor's weather, and they watch weather around the world. No low-pressure system in Asia is too obscure for them. No, no hiccup in the jet stream over Australia is too far removed. But this idea of the Weather Channel, no consumer ever 20 years ago would have said, you know what, what I need is a 24-7 opportunity uh, to watch weather. So there are certain things that consumers are not very good about predicting. Um, they're technologically naive uh, in the era of computers. Um, people have not been walk walking around the streets in the 80s and 90s and 2000s complaining that they, had no sh that they had no way to share their daily routines, their thoughts, their photos with thousands of friends. They weren't begging for all these new technologies that today are commonplace and are all in your, your pockets uh, 10 years ago because technologically they didn't understand that those things could exist. And one of my favorite quotes is this one from the chairman of Sony, the public doesn't know what's possible, but we do. So one of the problems of this marketing orientation is, yeah, let's ask customers what they want and need, what's turning them on, what's turning them off, uh, what they see as opportunities, but don't take it too seriously because probably they don't understand uh, what you have the manufacturing and technical capabilities to do. And then two other, <clears throat> uh, two final problems with asking consumers. One is even if they're trying to be as honest as they can, sometimes they're just plain wrong. And secondly, sometimes they really don't know what they want. So an example of the first case, they're just wrong. This is one of the classic examples. The new Coke. How many have heard the new Coke story? How many have heard of new Coke? OK. So wow. OK. 10% um, of you have even heard of it. In the 1980s, when was this? In the early 80s, I guess. So the story began, um, by 1985, Coca-Cola had been losing market share to Pepsi-Cola for years. And there was a very famous uh, ad campaign in the uh, early 80s, the so-called Pepsi Challenge, where uh, Pepsi-Cola uh, Pepsi would uh, sample Pepsi and Coke, blind taste test, and ask consumers which they like and the blindfold was, or the, the, the label was taken off the Coke can, and sure enough, 
9 out of 10 or 19 out of 20, an enormous percentage of people said, well, we really prefer uh, Pepsi to Coke in this blind test. So Coke's share was slipping, so Coke knew it had to do something dramatic. So uh, first, um, they put it this way. If we have twice as many, uh, this is the, um, the director of market research for Coca-Cola. If we have twice as many vending machines, we dominate uh, the, the fountain industry, which means restaurant and food service. Uh, we have more shelf space. We spend more advertising. We are competitively priced. Why are we losing so, so much market share? You look at Pepsi Challenge and you have to start wondering. So on April 23rd, 1985, New Coke was released. So this is a 100-year-old formula, sacrosanct, locked up in the vault of Coca-Cola, all this mystery about the formula for Coca-Cola. They had never come out with a new uh, flavor or brand or line item extension uh, in Coke's 100-year history. By the middle of June, cons uh, this, they introduced it, I said, in April. By the middle of June, uh, people were saying no to New Coke. Reaction to the Coke was swift and humiliating. The taste of New Coke was likened to sewer water, to furniture power, polish, to Coke for wimps. And most disheartening to Coca-Cola man management, uh, one consumer said it tastes like two-day-old Pepsi. Um, now, how could Coca-Cola, one of the most recognized marketing, uh, one of the most recognized brands in the world, and we'll take a look at some data on this in a few weeks, um, how could they have screwed up so colossally in terms of not reading the consumer market correctly? Uh, well, as it turns out, they interviewed, they did their market research, uh, they interviewed uh, 400,000 consumers uh, in taste tests. Coke's management made sure that the taste test results were checked and corroborated in every major market of the country. Um, what went wrong? Essentially, what went wrong is the uh, uh, consumers who tasted the product understood that they were tasting a, a new product flavor that Coca-Cola was considering launching but didn't understand uh, that the old Coke, the so oh, what became known as Coke Classic, was going to be taken gradually, taken gradually off the market. And so they said, yeah, this new one's pretty good. And they got something like 80 or 90% of consumers uh, that said, yeah, it really tastes pretty good. But none of them said, and we'd be willing to buy it before the Classic Coke. And so they really did, Coca-Cola's management really did follow the um, the example of what consumers said, but consumers were essentially wrong. Maybe partly they didn't have the full story, but they just got the story wrong. As it turned out, uh, Coca-Cola uh, reintroduced classic Coke. It was all over the world's newspapers that Coca-Cola made this incredible marketing blunder, although they were supposed to be the marketing uh, geniuses of the world with the best known brand and so on. So they got this enormous amount of free advertising, so much so that a lot of cynics claim that Coca-Cola staged this whole uh, escapade just to get the, the free advertising on the front page of the world's newspapers. I, I don't think that's the case, but who knows. Um, and then finally, consumers uh, often just don't know what they want. And uh, there's a lot of ways you could illustrate this, uh, but this isn't a bad one. Maybe you know Malcolm Gladwell. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell is a columnist uh, uh, and, and a writer. Uh, for The New Yorker magazine. He also is the author of several popular books, one of which you may have heard of called Blink. And in a recent uh, speech, if I can get this to work, uh, I'm going to play you just a segment. Let's try this here. Finally, he had a breakthrough. Oh. And he said, there is no perfect the pickle. There are only perfect pickles. <laughs> and he came back to them and he said, you don't just need to improve your regular. You need to create zesty. And that's where we got zesty pickles. <laughs> then the next person came to him, and that was Campbell's Soup. And this was even more important. In fact, Campbell's Soup is where Howard made his reputation. Campbell's made Prego. And Prego in the early 80s was struggling next to ragu, which was the dominant spaghetti sauce of the 70s and 80s. Now, in the industry, I don't know whether you care about this or how much time I have to go into this, but it was, technically speaking, this is an aside, prego is a better tomato sauce than ragu. The quality of the tomato paste is much better. The spice mix is far superior. It adheres to the pasta in a much more pleasing way. In fact, they would do the famous bowl test 
back in the 70s with, reg with ragu and prego, you'd have a plate of spaghetti and you would pour it on, right? And the ragu would all go to the bottom and the prego would sit on top. That's called adherence. And anyway, despite the fact that they were far superior in adherence and the quality of their tomato paste, prego was struggling. So they came to Howard and they said, fix us. And Howard looked at their product line and he said, what you have is a dead, potatoes society, a dead tomato society. So he said, this is what I want to do. And he got together with the Campbell's Soup Kitchen and he made 45 varieties of spaghetti sauce. And he varied them according to every conceivable way that you can vary tomato sauce. By sweetness, by level of garlic, by tartness, by sourness, by tomatoiness, by visible solids, my favorite term in, in, this, in the spaghetti sauce business. Every conceivable way you can vary spaghetti sauce, he varied spaghetti sauce. And then he took this whole raft of 45 spaghetti sauces and he went on the road. He went to New York, he went to Chicago, he went to Jacksonville, he went to Los Angeles. And he brought in people by the truckload into big halls. And he sat them down for two hours and he gave them over the course of that two hours ten bowls. Ten small bowls of pasta with a different spaghetti sauce on each one. And after they ate each bowl, they had to rate from zero to a hundred how good they thought the spaghetti sauce was. And at the end of that process, after doing it for months and months, he had a mountain of data about how the American people feel about spaghetti sauce. And then he analyzed the data. Now, did he look for the most popular brand variety of spaghetti sauce? No. Howard doesn't believe that there is such a thing. Instead, he looked at the data and he said, let's see if we can group these different, all these different data points into clusters. Let's see if they congregate around certain ideas. And sure enough, if you sit down and you analyze these, all this data on spaghetti sauce, you realize that all Americans fall into one of three groups. There are people who like their spaghetti sauce plain. There are people who like their spaghetti sauce spicy. And there are people who like it extra chunky. And of those three facts, the third one was the most significant. Because at the time, in the early 1980s, if you went to a supermarket, you would not find extra chunky spaghetti sauce. And Prego turned to Howard and they said, are you telling me that one third of Americans crave extra chunky spaghetti sauce and yet no one is servicing their needs? And he said, yes. And Prego then went back and completely reformulated their spaghetti sauce and came out with a line of extra chunky that immediately and completely took over the spaghetti sauce business in this country. And over the next 10 years, they made $600 million off their line of extra chunky sauces. And everyone else in the industry looked at what Howard had done and they said, oh my God, we've been thinking all wrong. And that's when you started to get seven different kinds of vinegar and 14 different kinds of of mustard and 71 different kinds of olive oil and, and then eventually even ragu hired Howard and Howard did the exact same thing for ragu that he did for Prego and today if you go to the supermarket, a really good one, and you look at how many ragus there are, do you know how many they are? 36 in six varieties. Cheese, light, robusto, rich and hearty, old world traditional, extra chunky garden. <laughs> That's Howard's doing. That is Howard's gift to the American people. Now why is that important? <clears throat> it is in fact enormously important. And I'll explain to you why. Because what Howard did is he fundamentally changed the way the food industry thinks about making you happy. Assumption number one in the food industry used to be that the way to find out what people want to eat, what will make people happy, is to ask them. And for years and years and years and years, Ragu and Prego would have focus groups. And they would sit all you people down and they would say, what do you want in a spaghetti sauce? Tell us what you want in a spaghetti sauce. And for all those years, 20, 30 years, through all those focus group sessions, no one ever said they wanted extra chunky. Even though at least a third of them, deep in their hearts, actually did. <laughs> People don't know what they want, right? As Howard loves to say, the mind knows not what the tongue wants. It's a mystery. An, import, an critically important step in understanding our own desires and tastes is to realize that we cannot always explain what we want deep down. If I asked all of you, for example, in this room, what you want in a coffee, you know what you'd say? Every one of you would say, I want a dark, rich, 
hearty roast. So people always say when you ask them what they want in a coffee, what do you like? Dark, rich, hearty roast. <laughs> what percentage of you actually like a dark, rich, hearty roast? According to Howard, somewhere between 25 and 27% of you. Most of you like milky, weak coffee. <laughs> but you will never ever say to someone who asks you what you want that I want a milky, weak coffee. <laughs> so that's number one thing that Howard did. Number two thing that Howard did is he, he made... Oh, you're going to have to guess what number two thing that Howard did was. Okay, so um, you, your problems with the marketing concepts is consumers don't always know what they want. They are sometimes wrong, and they're not very good at articulating it. Um, finally, uh, a passion for the customers. Well, sure, you've got to think about what customers want. You've got to listen to them carefully. But what about employees? What about uh, the satisfaction of your own employees and the linkages that that may or may not have with the, set, with the satisfaction of your customers? Um, let me tell you uh, uh, that uh, although I started class by saying that there's this notion, uh, this conventional notion that satisfied customers must lead to loyalty, sales, and profits, it hasn't been examined analytically very much. Uh, despite the fact that it's really almost impossible to pick up any uh, formal communication from an organization today without hearing the CEO write and say in the front page of the annual report that we're uh, interested in, in our customers and we're satisfying them as goal number one, uh, the link between those satisfied customers and the performance of the company uh, has been largely unexamined. So, we asked a question uh, a couple of years ago, how might we examine this notion? And what linkage are we talking about? It's this one right here. That employee satisfaction should lead to customer satisfaction, and that should lead to improved company performance. So we did the following. We went to a supermarket company, and uh, a supermarket company that had collected for years data from its customers on how satisfied they were with various aspects of the store, and data from its own employees about how happy the employees were. And the notion is, gee, if your employees aren't very happy and if it's pretty clear that they're unhappy, they're not going to be very excited about working hard for your organization and satisfying your customers. So we collected all these data on employee satisfaction, customer satisfaction, store performance, and we did some analysis. So for the customers, these are the kinds of factors we looked at. So, uh, on the right-hand side, you see what the customer survey items said. Um, and they said things like, uh, how, how would you rank the helpfulness of employees? Uh, how about the checkout service? How about service in the deli? Uh, how about advertised items, whether they're in stock or not in the store? Uh, further down, we asked about the quality of the different departments and the value at the bottom in terms of pricing and advertising and so on. And then we uh, performed an analysis called factor analysis. I'm not going to uh, go into that here. But factor analysis is an analytical technique that groups mathematically the responses from such a survey into similar uh, mathematical groups. And then you, the, the researcher has to name the groups, has to come up with a name that seems to sort of describe what all those factors that are mathematically correlated are. And over here on the left are the factors we gave to those correlated groups. So in the first group of uh, five factors you see, we called that customer service. In the next group of six or seven factors, we said, well, those things are somehow related to quality. And in the last case, we said they're related to value, pricing and value. So we said those are the three factors that seem to drive, that seem to be responsible for customer satisfaction in this particular uh, supermarket company. This was a major company with a huge market share in a major part of the United States. And we said, I wonder, we wondered how important each of those factors was in explaining the overall satisfaction, which was the last uh, question on this particular survey, how satisfied are customers overall in the performance of the store? And we found this, that those three factors had a roughly equal contribution to overall customer satisfaction. So if I wanted to explain 100% of customer satisfaction, about 32% of it could be explained by service, 36% by value, and 32% by quality. So, you know, fairly equal percentage. Now, that's when it got interesting. The next step was we compared the links between employee satisfaction, ES, 
and customer satisfaction, CS. We compared those links. And what we found is that overall employee satisfaction, bullet number one, overall employee satisfaction influences the customer satisfaction with the service levels. And uh, it, precisely how it influences it is that a one point, point increase in employee satisfaction results in a 0.1 increase in customer satisfaction with service. But overall employee, <laughs> overall employee satisfaction in no way affects the customer's satisfaction with quality or value. Now, let's think about that and explain it a little more carefully. What this says is that the satisfaction level of employees does affect how customers perceive your service. Because, and I think that makes sense, you walk into a supermarket, so employees seem very happy, they're waiting on you behind the deli, they're talking to you while they slice your bologna, uh, and, 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 and you're more satisfied with the service as a result. However, when you walk into a supermarket, you understand as a customer that the employees didn't have anything to do with the prices of the breakfast cereals, they didn't have anything to do with all the prices on the shelves in the grocery department, and they really didn't have, so there was no relation with value, and they really had no, relation, no involvement with the quality of the products either. Those are all determined by Procter & Gamble and Kraft Foods and, and uh, Chiquita Bananas. And so customers were essentially saying, sure, the service levels affect, uh, of, of employees affect uh, how happy we are with the store, but not, not with the quality and the value. So you, you see how this affects performance. So we did the following, uh, the last step of this analysis. We said, OK, here's the linkages. Now we're going to try to quantify for the CEO the extent to which he or she and their management team should invest in satisfying employees. Here's the, here's the story. A one point increase in store employee satisfaction leads to a 0.1 increase in the customer satisfaction with service. Okay, so there is this linkage with the factor of service. And that leads to a 1% increase in annual store sales. We measured sales uh, in this particular case per square foot. So, Employee satisfaction increases customer satisfaction, increases uh, 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 annual store sales per square foot by 1%. What does that mean? That equals, in this particular company, a $7 increase in the average per square foot sales. So their average sales before was $593 per square foot per year. So if you take a store like Wegmans, it's got 120,000 square feet. Each one of those square feet at Wegmans, this isn't Wegmans, but if it were, uh, has five, sells $593 worth of merchandise for every one of those 120,000 square feet uh, over the course of the year. So this employee satisfaction increased that by 7%. That $7, uh, $7 rather, not 7%, that $7 increased annual store sales by $400,000. So these are very small changes. 1% uh, one point change in employee satisfaction only increases customer satisfaction by 0.1, but because the stores are so big, there are so many customers, there's so many square feet, those little changes uh, result in $400,000 per store. And if a company has 100 stores or 200 stores, this particular company had five or 600 stores, uh, that $400,000 uh, is, is a significant increase in company performance. Um, we're going to continue this story next time. Have a great week.